Welcome back to Warren's County High School for another exciting episode of Economics in Unit 2. And we're continuing our talk on labor unions today. And we dropped off yesterday talking about basically what they are and why people join them. Let's look at some of the impacts that the labor unions have had on the United States. There's a lot of U.S. labor laws which would not exist had it not been for labor unions. So something was passed in 1935, something called the National Labor Relations Act, or is also known sometimes as the Wagner Act. And it's a law guaranteeing workers' rights to organize unions, to engage in collective bargaining, and the right to strike. So let's think about that. You absolutely have the right to form a union, and if you think about that, that'll go back to the First Amendment, freedom of assembly. The right to engage in collective bargaining, which means you can come together as a whole and say, we want to be paid this much money, and if you don't get that, you have the right to go on strike. This also made the idea of closed shops legal. Remember, that was the idea we talked about yesterday, that you can be forced to join a union in order to work somewhere. Now let's think about this. This is being passed right in the middle of the Great Depression in 1935, and this is very pro-worker. So FDR and the Congress are saying, okay, we're gonna allow workers to get some legal rights to make sure they have good wages and safe working conditions. Another act passed during this period is something called the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. And guys, the first thing this does is it creates a minimum wage. Now this is 1938, we get our first minimum wage. How much do you think it is? Here's how much it is. 25 cents an hour. So in 1938, you could earn a kingly sum of 25 cents per hour. And let's say you work the typical eight hour day, which is also gonna be something that was brought to you by the unions, you're gonna be earning how much money? $2 a day. So let's do the math, that would be $10 a week if you're working a 40 hour week. And a month you would basically be earning $160 per month. Doesn't sound like much money, but two, it's a different time and money had more value than it did. Another thing that comes from the Fair Labor Standards Act is the 40 hour work week. And think about what that means. We say that most Americans work 40 hours. If you work more than 40 hours, what is supposed to happen? You're supposed to be paid overtime. And the agreement is with overtime is you're paid what they call time and a half. So if you get paid $10 an hour normally, once you go past 40 hours, you're gonna be paid $10 an hour plus half of that again, which means $15 an hour. So a lot of people love to go past 40 a week because they're gonna get a whole lot of overtime pay and they really want that. Some people don't wanna work more than 40 hours a week. Some employers don't mind to give you overtime. Other employers try to keep you under 40 hours a week so you don't have to be paid time and a half. Sort of an advertisement of labor unions, the folks who brought you the weekend, child labor laws, overtime, minimum wage, injury protection, workman's compensation insurance, pension security, and the right to work. So what we're gonna see is labor unions start to become pretty powerful and they start to unionize and the government starts to get maybe a little bit nervous about it. So they're gonna pass something called the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947, which is gonna squash some of the power of labor unions. It set limits on the power. It made closed shops illegal. So going back to what we talked about yesterday, this idea that you have to join a union in order to work in a place is gonna be illegal after 1947. It also gave states the right to create those right to work laws, which we talked about. So a state may decide that we're gonna allow there to be states or, or basically jobs where there are no union jobs and you don't have to be forced to join a union of, of any sort. It prevented unions from contributing to federal election campaigns. So these unions get a whole lot of money together and they were contributing lots of money to people who were running for federal office to buy influence and once again, those people in Congress then would create more job or worker friendly laws. So this is gonna take away the ability of unions to give money to the elections at the federal level. So the Taft-Hartley Act prevented labor unions from indulging in unfair practices. Here's one of the more interesting parts of Taft-Hartley. It gave the government the power to end a strike for up to 80 days if the strike threatened national security or public health and safety. Now think about what that's saying. If a group of people go on strike and the federal government says, you guys can't strike because what you do is far too important. Almost like now when we have these uh, workers that have to go to work. You know, think about if every police officer went on strike. What would that be like? There would be lawlessness in the streets. If every nurse went on strike, that would be a problem. If every teacher went on strike, you wouldn't even know now because we're all at home. 
So if a group of workers decide they're going to strike, the federal government has the power to say, no, you can't strike, you're essential, so you have to go back to work for at least 80 days and keep doing your job, and during that 80-day period, we'll try to work something out. Well, one of the most famous, in my opinion, incidents that involved Taft-Hartley happened with this strike. And if you can see these guys, you can tell it's painfully uh, 80s because they're wearing these cool-looking shorts. Um, these are air traffic controllers. And they went on strike, and what they're going to say is, our job is super stressful. And a lot of uh, surveys and psychologists will tell you that air traffic controllers have one of the most stressful jobs in the world. Because they're up in the tower, they're telling planes when to land and when to take off. Basically every decision they make could be a bad decision that would cost maybe 500 people their lives if they ran two jumbo jets into each other. So it's extremely stressful work. And some of them felt they were working too many hours and they were overworked and they wanted more money and less time in the, on the job and they go on strike. Well, President Reagan at the time said, you guys can't go on strike because if we don't have air traffic controllers, that means airports can't function, which means planes can't fly. And planes are so important to get people from place to place, especially in the business world. A lot of people are traveling for business and it would really hurt our economy. So Reagan is gonna tell these air traffic controllers that they have to go back to work. And air traffic controllers tell President Reagan, we're not going back to work. So he says, if you don't go back to work by, and he gave a day, I will fire all of you. And they did not go back to work and Reagan fired them all. So on August 3rd, 18, sorry, 1981, he said they were in violation of their jobs. If they didn't go back to work, they'd be fired within 48 hours. And that's exactly what happened. So now we don't have any air traffic controllers. What do we do? Well, President Reagan used military air traffic controllers to land planes until they could retrain a new group. And one of the parts of this is he told the air traffic controllers, if you don't come back to work and I fire you, you can never do this job again. You can't say, okay, I'll, I'll come back. You made a decision and if you got fired, you can no longer be an air traffic controller for the federal government. So we'll see labor start to fight back. The largest labor union is formed out of the AFL and CIO, and these were two independent agencies which joined together in 1955, the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations. So they're the largest labor union in the United States, and there's lots of small unions that operate underneath the AFL, CIO, things like the UMWA, that's United Mine Workers Association, it used to be big in Kentucky and West Virginia. The UAW, the United Auto Workers, when we talked about them, all the people in Detroit building cars. The American Federation of Teachers, Lawyers Labor Union. And their current president is a guy named Rich Trumpka, who oddly enough used to be president of the UMWA back in the day. They boast now that they have 10 million members, so this is the largest organization. Remember the AFL-CIO was like a large umbrella agency over all these smaller label, or I'm sorry, these smaller unions. And you can look here, everything from plumbers, to riders, school employees, iron workers, aviation safety, um, aerospace workers, police, anything you can probably think of will fall under this umbrella of the AFL-CIO. Last thing we'll talk about today is a very infamous group of people who formed a union called the Teamsters. Now the Teamsters is known as the IBT or the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. And this was created in 1803. What they do is this is a union of freight carriers. And so where do they get this name Teamsters? Well, in 1803, if you were moving freight, you were probably moving it by wagon. And wagons were pulled by a team of horses. So that's where we get the name Teamsters for people who are hauling freight. But now it includes all these modern people, truck drivers, airline pilots, ship captains, engineers. I mean engineers like on the train, not that are drawing out equations I can't understand. So the Teamsters becomes a very powerful union and they have a guy named Jimmy Hoffa as their president, and he serves as Teamster president from 1957 to 1971. During his tenure, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters grows to 1.5 million members, and here is Jimmy Hoffa. Pretty interesting looking character here. So what we'll see is that as the Teamsters become super powerful and their president Jimmy Hoffa becomes super powerful and influential, the government starts to get a little nervous about him. So, Hoffa becomes powerful and famous, but it turns out he's linked to organized crime, which is the mob or the mafia. So he's investigated by the federal government and sentenced to prison in 1967 for numerous charges, which included bribery,
fraud, and jury tampering. tampering. Uh, one of the more famous squabbles in history would be when this was Bobby Kennedy, who was then the Attorney General, the prosecutor for the United States, basically going after Jimmy Hoffa. And there's a lot of courtroom scenes here, and you can still find this stuff and see it. And they really were pretty much an equal of each other, uh, fighting over who was telling the truth and who wasn't. And there's a pretty interesting movie called Hoffa, which stars Jack Nicholson as Jack Hoff or as Jimmy Hoffa, if you want to go back and watch it. But he does go to jail, and he stays in jail until 1971, where he is granted a pardon by the president. So, you history majors, who was the president in 1971? You were correct, Richard Nixon. So Nixon lets him out of jail in 1971. And oddly enough, Jimmy Hoffa will disappear in 1975 to never be seen again. And no one knows what happened to him. So this becomes a big deal. Jimmy Hoffa goes missing. Now this is a very famous and powerful person who had led the Teamsters to great strength. He's put in prison because we find out he's part of the mafia and very crooked. He's pardoned by Nixon. He's back out and all of a sudden he disappears. And so no one knows where Jimmy Hoffa is and everyone has their theories about what happened to him. But one of the more interesting theories about where Jimmy Hoffa is, and during pretty much most of my, my life, this is where everyone said Jimmy Hoffa was, right here. Buried in the end zone of Giant Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey. So that is what the folklore tells us, that Jimmy Hoffa was killed and his body was buried here in the end zone of the football stadium. Now since that, uh, the show Mythbusters came and they had some little uh, radar, sonar detector thing and they ran it all over the field. And guess what they found? Absolutely nothing. So Jimmy Hoffa is not here. Uh, there's a lot of thought that maybe uh, sometimes people who run cement companies or concrete businesses, especially up around the East Coast, are also involved in the mob. And maybe he had done some of the mob uh, bosses wrong in the past and they had him go for a little ride. And if he was the Godfather, you know how that works. Anyway, a whole lot about Jimmy Hoffa, who's just one of the more interesting characters that came from the rise of labor unions here in the United States. And we'll stop it right here for the day, and we'll talk more fun economics tomorrow.